Good morning, Jerusalem. Is it well with your soul? What a blessing it is again to be able to share the word of God with you on this last Sunday of the month. Well, this is the last of the eight messages that comprise the series on the Beatitudes. Or, well, should I say that we've got one more that we hope to share next Sunday that connects with this one. So just think of this as part A. And next week, we trust that we can share part B with you. It is my prayer that you have been enlightened, encouraged, and enriched by these messages. You know, it is very important for us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to do so, we must have a better understanding of ourselves. And these previous Beatitudes should have helped us in that aspect. Well, for this message, turn with me again to Matthew chapter 5. And we'll look at verse 10. That's Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10. And there we will find these words written. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for another day. We thank you this morning for another opportunity to be able to share your word. We thank you for your guidance, your grace, and your goodness to us. And God, we thank you for the privilege of being called your children. Thank you for the blessed assurance we have in our salvation in Jesus Christ. And we pray that we will live in such a way that we'll always bring you glory, honor, and the praise that you so rightly deserve. We ask now, God, that you will give us ears to hear, hearts to believe, and wills to carry out your divine will in our lives. And we will be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. This morning, I want to talk about the persecuted blessed. That's right. The persecuted blessed. As we have considered these passages known as the Beatitudes, one of the things that we have noticed is that each beatitude is a description of a person that tells us something about the person. We have learned that Jesus described the character of one who is blessed by God as one who is poor in spirit. He's one who mourns, one who is meek, one who hungers and thirsts, one who is merciful, one who is pure in heart, and one who is a peacemaker. But as we come to this beatitude, it tells us not so much about the person, but something that happens to the person. He is not described as doing anything or even being anything, but he is described as having something being done to him. He is persecuted. It is though Jesus is saying that if you be the kind of person described above, this is what you can expect. You will be persecuted because you are righteous. But even my brothers and sisters, this is a blessed state. Now, this might seem strange to us because one would think that being such a righteous person or being good for that matter would make things better for you and not bring about persecution. But such is not the case. See, just because you are good or you display a righteous life, it does not exempt you from the perils and pitfalls in life. Just because you trust God, it does not give you a pass on persecution in this life. As a matter of fact, you seemingly might catch more hell as you contemplate your trip to heaven. But an understanding of God's word can help us in that respect. You know, one of my favorite passages of scripture is Psalm 73. And I go to it often 
when it seems like my service is in vain. So let me just read it for you because it's going to help me make my first point. It says, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are no bands in their debt, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. And they have more than their heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouths against the heavens. And their tongue walketh through the earth. And therefore, his people return hither, and waters are full cup and wrung out to them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in, in vain, and I've washed my hands in innocence. For all day long, I have been plagued. And I've been chasing every morning. And if I say, well, I'll speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of my children. Well, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Yes, my brothers and sisters, this passage helps me when I feel like all my service and righteous living for the Lord is in vain. Yet it is that last verse that gives me hope and allows me to see the faithfulness of God. See, although the psalmist wants to throw in a tithe because it looked like the wicked was prospering and he was not, it was when he went into the sanctuary of God and got a glimpse of God's faithfulness to give him hope. In God's presence, Persecution and perceived unfairness is put in perspective and will help me remember that. And here's my first point. Righteousness is always accompanied by persecution. That's right. Righteousness is always accompanied by persecution. See, it is important that we understand that the message of the kingdom is not about how to get along in a sinful world. See, many make the mistake of trying to reconcile that which is irreconcilable. And we try to make sense of stuff that doesn't make sense at all. Most people have the idea that if we work hard at getting along with the world, then everything can be worked out harmoniously. But they fail to understand that there is a God-ordained antithesis in this world. Genesis chapter 3. In verse 15, it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And this references Christ and his followers of faith and Satan and his followers. The serpent's seed bruised the heel of the woman's seed, but the woman's seed crushed the head of the serpent's seed. See, God put enmity there and you can't erase it. It's a truth that rules throughout the scripture and in human history. From Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, Esau and Jacob, there's always conflict between the two. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, we find the concluding words of the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which is the prophecy of the coming kingdom. And in that interpretation, Four kingdoms are depicted, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and the Roman Empire. A fifth kingdom also is identified as either the divided remnants of Rome before being conquered by Christianity or a kingdom to come. But in the end, God's kingdom is to break in pieces and consume all of the kingdoms, and it is his kingdom only 
that's going to stand forever. See, the very nature of the kingdom of God is one of conflict and taking over. So don't try to hold together that which God is breaking up. The words of Jesus also gives us good counsel in that he says in John 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Paul, in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, admonished the saints saying, we shall through much tribulation enter the kingdom. John, in Revelation 7, 14, saw a numberless multitude coming out of great tribulation who had washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And Paul even said to Timothy, everyone that will live godly will suffer persecution. So remember, my brothers and sisters, that the very nature of the kingdom is one of conflict and righteousness is always accompanied by persecution. You cannot live a life of discipleship in this world and not be persecuted in some shape, form, or fashion. And that leads me to my second point, which is this. Persecution is only blessed if it is for righteousness sake. Let me say that again. Persecution is only blessed if it is for righteousness sake. This is a sinful world in which we live. And as a result of that fact, nobody gets through life without suffering. There's no harmony in a sinful world. And therefore, we don't need to be confused about the persecution that Jesus is speaking of. See, his is a persecution that comes to us for righteousness sake. Now, a thoughtful consideration of life will help us to also identify at least two other causes of persecution. And the first persecution is a persecution that is common to life. It can be seen in issues and conflicts between black and white, rich or poor, educated and illiterate, and other individuals of different backgrounds. See, all can live on the block together, but there are vast differences. Some think that they are better than others and they are hated because of those differences. So a lot of people are persecuted just for being who they are. Our society is filled with people of different cultures and that fact alone brings about persecution. You know, in biblical times, Jews didn't get along with Samaritans and everybody hated Gentiles, Pharisees and Sadducees had their issues with one another, and it continues today. People being persecuted for the simple fact of who they are. But then there is another type of persecution that we bring up on ourselves. See, we don't like to admit it, but many times, many of the troubles that we face are caused by us. That's right. We do things or we don't do some things that cause us to be persecuted. And many times it is our attitudes and our disposition that has been the direct cause of some of the stuff that we bring up on ourselves. Listen to what Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. He says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you, on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matter. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You see, some persecution comes because of who we are. And some other persecutions come because of what we do. But the persecution that Jesus is talking about here is, a, is that kind that comes because of our righteousness. And this righteousness is defined 
by our obedience to the word of God. One example of persecution that the first church experienced was in Acts chapters 3 and 4. Peter and John were told not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus. Now, Peter saw the issue very clearly. Either obey God or obey man. Well, they decided to obey God and they were imprisoned and threatened. But then in chapter 5, the same thing happened. And they were told again, didn't we straightly command you not to teach in this name? And again, the response was, we ought to obey God rather than man. But this time, they not only were threatened, but they were beaten also. But note their response to the persecution. It says, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. See, to obey God because of your love for him and then to suffer for it, this is persecution for righteousness sake. It shows that you love God more than life itself. And it takes one who has truly experienced the grace of God and knows what is at stake to do so. Well, that leads me to my last point, which is this. Unless you are in the kingdom, you will not suffer persecution for righteousness sake. All right? Yeah. Unless you are in the kingdom, you will not suffer persecution for righteousness sake. Now, let me be clear about this statement. Jesus is not saying that if you're persecuted or just because you're persecuted, you're going to get in the kingdom. No, that's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is that unless you are in the kingdom, you will not suffer persecution. Or because you are already in the kingdom, you will be persecuted. See, human nature is inclined to be self-protective. So in order to get along, we go along. We're not looking for trouble. But there's going to come a time when we will have to draw the line in the sand and say, this far and no further. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They were doing good in Babylon. They had good positions in the government. They had the king's favor. What more could they ask for? But the time came when what they believed and who they believed in were put to the test. And so a statue was made and they were charged by law to bow or burn. They faced a choice, bow or burn. Well, these brothers chose to burn. Now, it should make you wonder, if these are who are in the kingdom, would rather suffer for the kingdom's sake, what does this say about people who will not do kingdom business even when there's no persecution involved. If they don't do righteousness when there's no persecution involved, what makes you think that they will be righteous in the face of persecution? What that does is raise a serious question about your relationship in the kingdom. Well, here's what we need to understand in everything I've said, my brothers and sisters. In this life, a believer will be persecuted, some more than others. Yet that persecution should not keep us from our duty to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, nor keep us from living as his disciples in a hostile world. In Acts chapter 20, the apostle Paul called for the elders of the Ephesian church to meet him at Miletus because he knew that this might be the last time that he might see them. And as he began to encourage them to remain faithful to their call, Paul says to them in verse 22, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witness that in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life so dear to myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus.
to testify the gospel of the grace of God. In essence, Paul says, fellas, I don't know if I'm going to see you all again. But I do know that the Holy Ghost has revealed to me that as I go to Jerusalem and any other city, I'm going to be persecuted. There is no way around it. But you know what? That's okay. I'm not moved with fear nor hesitancy to go. Neither do I think my life so dear or so precious that I need to try to save it by not going. Paul says, I've got to finish the course of ministry that the Lord has given to me and that is to testify the gospel grace of Jesus Christ. See, Paul knew that he was going to be persecuted, but he endured by the grace of God. We know that we are going to be persecuted, but we also can endure by the grace of God. And the reason that we can endure is because of the sinless one, Jesus Christ. He suffered and was persecuted, but he endured. Hebrews 12, 3 says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your mind. In other words, if you think you can't endure persecution, just think about Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, but he never said a mumbling word. They whipped him with a whip that tore the flesh from his bones. They spat on him. They mocked him. They put a crown of thorns on his head and pressed it down until blood came streaming down. Then they nailed his hands and feet to an old rugged cross. He hung him high and stretched him wide between two thieves out on Mount Calvary. And there for the sins of the world, he died. A death that belonged to us, he took up on himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteous of God through Christ. Well, they took him off their cross and they laid him in a barber tomb where he lay for three days and nights. But early in the Sunday morning, at the first day of the week, he arose triumphantly with all power and authority in his hands. And listen, my brothers and sisters. Since he has all power in his hand, the promise is, as you go and make disciples, teaching and baptizing, don't worry if you're persecuted for my sake. If you are, I'll be with you always because yours is the kingdom of heaven. My brothers and sisters, I ask, are you one of the persecuted blessed? Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, we say thank you this morning for helping us to understand that in this life, as we seek to live a righteous life for you, we will be persecuted. God, we thank you for the blood of Christ that was shed for us. We thank you for the enduring persecution that he went through on our behalf so that we might be made the righteous of God in Christ. God, we thank you so much for salvation. And I pray that if there's one who's listened to my voice, who have not trusted him as Lord and Savior of their life, they'll admit the fact that they're a sinner in need of salvation. They'll accept what Christ did on their behalf at Calvary. They'll believe that he died for their justification, arose for their justification, and they'll trust him as the Lord and Savior of their life. God, thank you so much for helping us to know that we can be persecuted and still be blessed because you are God who's in control of everything. Father, we love you. We thank you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, again, as we go away, let us remember what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. And don't forget, as you go, forgive somebody because someone needs forgiveness now. 
And as the opportunity presents itself, share the love of Jesus Christ with those you come in contact with. And remember, at Jerusalem, we are ministering with eternity in view.